Chapter 5 of Two Treaties on Government uh, by John Locke. I want to take a, a little bit of a closer, close look at that um, because it's on property. So, uh, Chapter 5 is entitled, this is the second treaty. This, chapter 5 is uh, of property, and there's some interesting ideas that come up in here. So let's just uh, sort of highlight those at first, and then I want to read through Chapter 5, and I'll try to um, give some commentary that will build up some ideas that are very important for us. So... Um, just to remind myself, and I want to go through this list. Uh, state of nature is a state of natural law. Okay, so we'll look for that. The labor theory of property. Uh, and when I say property, um, and when Locke talks about property, we're talking about real property, like real estate, like a real estate agent who sells a, a house. Um, that kind of property that we're thinking of. We're not thinking of, you know, uh, your favorite watch, and that's, that's a personal possession. That, that's, we're thinking about property like land, okay, land property. So this is coming out of feudalism where wealth is um, conceived of as land property. And now here is where we have the ascending bourgeois uh, revolutionaries who are conducting a, a kind of bourgeois revolution in parliament and through the Commonwealth, we had the House of Commons uh, take over and then run by Cromwell, this landed gentry, uh, not of the nobility. We have this revolutionary commoners um, who are largely bourgeois in that they are city people as opposed to country people because in the country, that's where the no nobles live and in their country estates and kind of dominate things out there, but in the city, things are up for grabs, and the and the the bourgeoisie are taking over, and not only taking over the city, but also taking over the government. And here we have Locke undermining this feudal notion of property and the legitimacy of nobility to claim large tracts of property in their country estates. He's calling that into question uh, very specifically and giving a theoretical argument against the legitimacy of that. So we want to look for that. Uh, this is all part of the bourgeois revolution. Uh, it, but notice uh, here I have labor theory of value. We actually see some of the beginnings of the labor theory of value here in Locke, um, which is a Marxist concept. So what's very important to understand is that the concepts of the bourgeois revolution are adopted by Marxism. And the Marxist vision of the socialist revolution is not to throw away the bourgeois revolution and try to go back to some kind of feudalism, the Marxist revolution is conceived of as building upon the bourgeois revolution and taking things in a different direction, but, but uh, incorporating all the, at least many of the revolutionary concepts of the bourgeois revolution. Uh, Marx sees the bourgeois revolution as a good thing, that feudalism was bad and the bourgeois order is better, but Marxism believes that it could be better yet. And, uh, and the labor theory of value is part of that. And here we see the beginning of that uh, in Locke's discussion of property. And we'll notice that he talks about appropriating commons as waste. So um, this all points to the problem of the enclosure of the commons, which was ongoing throughout this period, as we saw before, uh, that it was causing a lot of civil unrest. 
And, uh, and then we'll also see him talk about the civilizing mission of colonialism, where he's justifying colonialism, uh, which we've seen uh, how, how disastrous colonialism can be. Okay, so uh, of property. And this is uh, on Gutenberg.org, Gutenberg uh, the Gutenberg Project and uh, is freely available. Uh, and Gutenberg in general is a good source of texts. Uh, a lot of philosophical texts uh, are readily available there. And uh, let's see, can I make this? No, that doesn't. Right, so I'll try to make it as big as I can. So it's a little easier to read, but if you have trouble reading it, you can go to this URL up at the top. If you just go to Gutenberg.org, uh, you can find it or click on the link that's in the outline. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, but you might want to uh, have the page open for yourself so you can read it a little better because some of the, you know, the, the quality deteriorates, so it can be a little blurry. Um, but I just want to show you where I'm at. And notice the sections are numbered, so it's quite easy to follow along because of the, the sectioning numbers. Okay, so section 25. Whether we consider natural reason, which tells us that men being once born have a right to their preservation and consequently to meat and drink and such other things as nature affords for their subsistence, or on the other hand, revelation, which gives us an account of those grants God made of the world to Adam and to Noah and his sons. Either way, it is very clear that God, as King David says in Psalms, uh, what is that, 65, verse 16, God has given the earth to the children of men, given it to mankind in common. Okay, so here he's pointing up the issue of the commons, that the world initially, the entire world was a commons. But this being supposed, it seems to some a very great difficulty how anyone should ever come to have a property in anything. So how does property come about? If the entire world originally started out as commons, how does it become the specific property of one particular person or another? I will not content myself to answer that if it be difficult to make out property upon a supposition that God gave the world to Adam and his prosperity in common, it is impossible that any man but one universal monarch should have any property upon a supposition that God gave the world to Adam and his heirs in succession exclusive of all the rest of his posterity. But I shall endeavor to show how men might come to have a property in several parts of that which God gave to mankind in common and that without any express compact of all the commoners. Okay, so uh, he's arguing specifically against uh, the guy that he argued uh, that he did a detailed analysis of in the first uh, treaties, and I can't remember that guy's name, uh, but he is a royalist, and one of the claims there that, that Locke focuses on is that, is that uh, the monarch the divine right of kings argues that the right of the king goes all the way back to uh, Adam, that the king is somehow invested with the right of a monarch because Adam was originally invested with the right of a monarch. And, and Locke shows how this just conceptually doesn't make sense. And so he's assuming, he's assuming that the biblical account in the Old Testament in Genesis is historically accurate. That's just part of the, the context of, of the whole argument. Uh, but he shows even on those terms, assuming that the, the narrative of Genesis in the Bible is correct, uh, there's all sorts of complications 
that and the monarch can't make claim to these rights of Adam for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but he wants to focus on this claim that the monarch has right to all the property of a land, for example, in England. What makes it that the monarch claims to have the right to the entire land of England? Because that is the way the feudal order worked. Remember that the, the monarch really has title and, and right to the entire land. And then through the, the agreements of vassalage, a, a particular vassal, a, a, a baron, a, a duke, uh, let's focus on a duke, would be given uh, title and responsibility for a particular parcel of land, but it nonetheless was still part of the title of the monarch. So you have this hierarchical structure uh, you know, kind of along the lines of like Leibniz's monadology, but just in terms of land. Okay, so uh, okay, so so he wants to show how okay, although the divine right of the monarch doesn't work out. How is it that some people do have legitimate title to some parcel of land? How, does, how is property actually legitimated, not through this phony divine right of kings argumentation, but how it, it actually works according to natural law and assuming a kind of uh, primitive history that, that he will concoct? Okay, so section 26. God, who hath given the world to men in common, hath also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. Oh, and I, I did want to mention one other thing. Um, that men being once born have a right to their preservation and consequently to meat and drink and such other things as nature affords for their subsistence that people have a natural right to life, which means they have a natural right to adequate food and adequate housing and adequate uh, shelter from storms and, and the vicissitudes of, of nature, that that's a natural right. Uh, that's something very much that Marx agrees with. Um, and, uh, you know, but Marx wants to go to go a little farther. Uh, maybe I should just mention that here. Marx isn't saying that everyone has a natural right to just subsistence, but that to whatever degree working in common through variable labor, which is not only variable in terms of putting in more hours or, or working harder, but also combining our efforts in social work through like the division of labor or just coming together to do a big project whatever the entire social group is able to achieve in terms of uh, 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 a rise in overall wealth of the community that everyone should get a proportional share of that uh, in essentially an equal share in that uh, to the degree that makes sense. And um, uh, so Marx wants to go a little further than that. So there's a, this isn't a kind of primitive Marxism or a primitive communism. The point that Locke is making is that everyone at bare minimum allows, should be, has the right to food and shelter, et cetera, that will keep them alive. That's just a bare minimum. Uh, and of course, we see that in our, our day, that right is not upheld. So if we have refugees showing up at our southern border from Mexico, but also from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, fleeing um, death squads, we do not naturally give them sanctuary. Uh, Locke would see that as a problem. I mean, maybe politically he might have some mental gymnastics to get around it, but in, in, in principle, he'd have a problem with that. And 
and if we have uh, refugees showing up at the southern border from Afghanistan, for example, or or Syria, uh, these kind of places that people are fleeing from because they just simply cannot live there, just literally, it's unlivable that uh, these refugees have the right to some minimal subsistence. And even people living within the United States, we have, uh, we have millions of children that will go to sleep tonight hungry, living in the United States, because they are not afforded the basic human right of having adequate food. That's not part of our system. Um, and so this is an issue that's still alive and well today. Okay, so section 26, let me begin that again. Uh, God who had the, given the world to men in common hath also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. That's this highlighted part. Uh, life is that basic subsistence, which everybody has a right to. And then convenience is like that extra, the surplus, which Mark says the convenience, the surplus should be divided evenly. Um, to some extent, right? Not, not, not mechanically evenly, but uh, in a relatively equal, equal way. Um, so life versus convenience. Okay, that distinction is important. Okay, so the earth and all that is therein is given to men for the support and comfort of their being. And though all the fruits and nat it naturally produces and beast it feeds belong to mankind in common as they are pro uh, produced by the spontaneous hand of nature and nobody nobody has originally a private dominion exclusive to the rest of mankind in any of them as they are thus in their natural state yet being given for the use of men there must of necessity be a means to appropriate them some way or, or another before they can be of any use or at all beneficial to any particular man in order. So all the beasts of the fields and all the land, everything belongs to everybody in common in a state of nature. But in order to actually use the produce of nature to use the ecology somebody has to appropriate it that has to appropriate a portion of it you know if you go out and you kill a bear and then you skin it and use the bear hides and use the meat for food you've appropriated that from the commons so what gives you legitimate right to appropriate a bear or to appropriate a goat, or to appropriate a woolly mammoth, as I, you know, as projecting this, and he's thinking primitively, like back in primitive society before there was civilization. What would make it legitimate for me to go and appropriate a saber-toothed tiger and use it for my own use, wants and needs, right? Yet being given for the use of men, there must of necessity be a means of appro to appropriate them some way or another before they can be used uh, or at all beneficial to any particular person. Okay, the fruit or venison, which nourishes the wild Indian, who knows no enclosure, like enclosure of the commons, and is still a tenant in common must be his and so his. In other words, a part of him that another can no longer have any right to uh, before it can do him any good for the support of his life. 
So he has to take it from the commons in order to use it for his life and his comfort. Section 27. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. Okay, so now this is a key concept in Locke is that he thinks of the human body as being a property of the person. Property like in the sense of when you take a particular piece of land and build a house on it, naturally your body is your own property and uh and uh so we want to want to keep that in mind the lingo here is kind of you know uh not quite king james but uh, a little bit uh, archaic so i want to make sure that there's some clarity here uh, because of the archaic nature of the english um so every man, every person has a property in their own person. This nobody has any right to but themselves. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. So notice that word properly and property uh, have a common etymology in English, and that comes across nicely. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state of nature uh, hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and joined to it something that is his own and therefore makes it his property. So when I go out and I appropriate, let's say a saber tooth tiger and I use it to sustain my life, which I have a right to, a natural right to, but also to create conveniences like maybe a hammock made out of, out of the, the hide so I can relax after a day of hunting. Um, what, what makes it properly mine and therefore my property is that I put in the labor of hunting the saber tooth tiger and preparing the hide. My labor is invested in it and my labor is naturally my property. Okay, so here we're getting the uh, labor theory of value, but conceived of in terms of property. It being by him removed from the common state, nature hath placed in it, it hath by his labor become something annexed to it, added to it, that excludes the common right of other men. For this labor being the unquestionable property of the laborer, no man but he can have a right to what that is once joined to, at least where there is enough and as good left in common for others. So once I put labor into something, it's mine because my labor naturally belongs to me. And when I add labor value to something that nature provides, that's what allows me to legitimately take it as my own. Uh, as long as there is enough, enough quantity and quality of goods for at least the subsistence of everyone else. Section 28, he that is nourished by the acorns he picked up under an oak or the apple he gathered from the trees in the wood has certainly appropriated them for himself or to himself. Nobody cannot deny, but the nourishment is his. Okay, I took these acorns, they didn't really belong to me prior to, but since I put in the effort of actually collecting them, now they belong to me. And of course, if you want some, you can go collect your own. Um, I asked then, when did they begin to be his? When he digested, or when he eat, or when he boiled, or when he brought them home, or when he picked them up? And it is plain 
if the first gathering made them not his, nothing else could. So it was that picking up. Once he picked them up, he had put labor into them. And from thenceforth, from there, from that point forth, forward, I'm mixing archaic English with, with modern English. Uh, so from that point forward, once he put some labor into them, any addition, that it's his property. And now he's just putting labor into his own property. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that labor put a distinction between them and common. That added something to them more than nature, the common mother of all had done. Labor adds value. And so they became his private right. And will anyone say he who had no right to those acorns or apples he thus appropriated because he had not the consent of all mankind to make them his? Okay, so now. Um, Locke is calling into question Hobbes's theory of social contract. Does there have to be some contract to say that I can pick up an acorn before I can just do it? Uh, Locke is going to say, no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, there's a kind of natural right to appropriate. Okay. Was it a robbery thus to assume to himself what belonged to all in common? If such a consent as that was necessary, man had starved, notwithstanding the plenty God had given him. There's all these acorns and I'm just not gonna pick them up and prepare them for food because I don't have an agreement of everybody on the earth. That doesn't make sense. Okay, practically that doesn't make sense. We see in commons, which remain so by compact, that it is the taking any part of what is common and removing it out of the state of nature leaves it in which begins the property without which the common is of no use. And the taking of this or that part does not depend on the express consent of all commoners. Thus the grass my, my horse has bit, the turfs my servant has cut, and the ore I have digged in any place where I have a right to them in common with others become my property without the assignation or consent of anybody. The labor that was mine, removing them out of what, uh, of, out of that common state they were in has fixed my property in them. Okay. So again, the labor that I put into things makes them my property because I've added value to them. Notice that he does mention, uh, the turfs my servant has cut. So he's already building in, he's thinking of a primitive state of nature, but he's already projecting servitude uh, into this primitive state, uh, which of course becomes problematic by the end of this chapter, which maybe is not a mistake on Locke's part, okay. So section 29, by making an explicit consent of every commoner necessary to anyone's appropriating to himself any part of what is given in common, children or servants could not cut the meat, which their father or master had provided for them in common without assigning to everyone his particular part. Though the water running in the fountain be every one's, yet who can doubt but that in the pitcher is his only who drew it out. His labor hath taken it out of the hands of nature where it was common and belonged equally to all her children and hath thereby appropriated it to himself. Okay, so this lingo of appropriation is very, um, very important because Marx talks about appropriation quite frequently and he's thinking very much in these terms of property and the fact that you work up upon something in nature, you put your labor value into it and then naturally that gives you property rights to it. And what the capitalist does is appropriate the labor invested 
through the mechanisms that I described earlier. Okay, section 30. Thus, this law of reason makes the dealer in Indians who hath, who hath killed it, uh, it is allowed to be his goods who hath bestowed his labor upon it, though before it was the common right of everyone. And amongst those who are counted the civilized part of mankind, who have made, the, made and multiplied positive laws to determine property, this original law of nature for the beginning of property in what was before common still takes place. So whether it's an uncivilized quote unquote Indian, as he says, some uh, indigenous person who lives outside of civilization, as he's conceiving of it, um, you know, they appropriate things naturally in a state of, of at least a quasi state of nature. Um, but even in civilized countries where there is are the legal structures, the legal structure of property rights is all based in this natural right to property to appropriate the commons of nature when it is invested with your own labor. Okay. <clears throat> And by virtue thereof, what fish anyone catches in the ocean, that great and still remaining common of all mankind, or what ambergris anyone takes up here is by the labor that removes it out of that common state nature left it in, made his property, who takes that, that pains about it. And even among, amongst us, the hare that anyone is hunting is thought his his who pursues her during the chase. So if you hunt a rabbit, whoever actually does the hunting, that makes it yours. For being a beast that is still looked upon as common and no man's private possession, whoever has employed so much labor about any of that kind as to find and pursue her has thereby removed her from the state of nature, therein she was common and hath begun a property. Okay, so this is also going back to uh, or, or connected with Marx's ideas of species beings that human beings naturally want to work on their environment and modify nature and appropriate certain parts of it to themselves. Uh, and that's just part of human nature. And, and then, of course, when we put in labor to do these things, then that's, that's what makes it our property. Our, Marx would have no disagreement uh, so far, uh, except for maybe that servitude thing, which, you know, seems like a poison pill, um, which will come out later. Okay, section 31. It will perhaps be objected to this that if gathering the acorns or other fruits of the earth, etc., makes it a right to them, then anyone may engross as much as he will. To which I answer, not so. So anybody could just gather all the acorns they they wanted to any extent or gather apples to any extent and just stockpile apples and he says not so no the same law of nature that does by its this means give us property does also bound that property too there's a limit god has given us all things richly first timothy 6 chapter or verse 12 is the voice of reason confirmed by inspiration but how far has he given it to us to enjoy as much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils so much he may by his labor fix a property in so you can't just stockpile apples if you're not going to eat them and just let them rot that's that's not natural right. Whatever is beyond this, you know, actually using it before it spoils, whatever goes beyond this is more than his share and, be, and belongs to others. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. Okay. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. And thus, considering the plenty of natural provisions, 
there was a long time in the world and the few spenders and to how small a part of that provision the industry of one man could extend itself and engross it to the prejudice of others, especially keeping within the bounds set by reason of what might serve his use, there could be then little room for quarrels or contentions about property so established. So when there's very few people and there's lots of open land and lots of produce of nature, you're gathering acorns, gathering apples, whatever the case may be, uh, blueberries and uh, hunting a rabbit, there's not gonna be much quarreling about property. And obviously if you stockpile a bunch of apples, you're not gonna just let them sit there and rot. Um, and even if you did, there's plenty of apples for everybody to go around. So there's not really questions about property rights in this, in this state of nature uh, before civilization. Section 32, but the chief matter of property being now not the fruits of the earth and the beasts that subsist on it, but the earth itself, that's what's happening right now. People are appropriating portions of the land of the earth itself <coughs> as that which takes in and carries with it all the rest. I think it is plain that property in that too is acquired as the former. So on your land, there might be a bunch of rabbits that live there and you're appropriating them for your purposes. And uh, he's gonna say that you have some right to that and, and the rabbits that are on your land, but it has to be within the reasons of uh, the limits of reason. And let's see what that is. So it's just like the former case before there's enclosure of land enclosure of commons. As much land as a man tills, plants, improves, cultivate, and can use the product of, so much is his property. He, by his labor, does, as it were, enclose it from the commons. For will it invalidate his right to say everybody else has an equal title to it? And therefore he cannot appropriate he cannot enclose without the consent of all his fellow commoners, all mankind. God, when he gave the world in common to all mankind, commanded man also to labor. And the, and the penury of his condition required it of him. Yeah, at the, if you're familiar with Adam and Eve, right? They eat the apple and they perceive good and evil and they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden and now they have to... Um, God says to Adam, you will now live by the sweat of your brow. And so this is like an originary myth to explain why labor is necessary because of the original sin uh, of Adam. Um, but it is quite apparent that in a primitive state of nature, in order to live, you have to labor. Okay. Um, God and his reason commanded him to subdue the earth. This is also from the Adam and Eve story, subdue the earth. In other words, to improve it for the benefit of life and therein lay out something upon it that was his own, his labor. He hath in obedience to this command of God subdued, tilled and sold any part of it, thereby annexed it to something that was his property the now he's thinking of the land as being annexed or conjoined to the labor and the labor naturally belongs to the person which another had no title to nor could without injury take from him notice that he does say here and this may not be very clear with the archaic english and the grammatical construction but what he's saying that it is not uh, lawful according to natural right for someone to take the labor of somebody else. It's not lawful, it's not right in a natural state of things, natural right. There is no natural right to appropriate the labor of other people. Marx would agree. 
And Marx is saying that's exactly what the capitalist does. The capitalist appropriates the labor of other people. That's what's wrong with capitalism. Okay, so section 33. Nor was this appropriation of any parcel of land by improving it any prejudice to any other man since there was still enough and as good left. So there's plenty of quantity and quality of land. So uh, whatever I appropriate, you can appropriate as much as you want. It's, it's, there's plenty. And more than the yet unprovided could use. Okay, so there's plenty more than anybody can use. So that in effect, there was nevertheless left for others because of his enclosure for himself. For he that leaves as much as another can make a use of does as good as taking nothing at all. Nobody could think himself injured by drinking from another, uh, drinking of an, by the drinking of another man, though he took a good draft. Like if you're at a river and somebody's drinking, <laughs> they're full, you can't hold that against them because you could do the same. There's plenty. A whole who had a whole river of the same water left to him to quench his thirst. And the case of land uh, and water, where there is enough of both, is perfectly the same. Uh, and notice that in the case uh, of water, land and water, where there is enough of both, this is interesting from today's perspective in, in 2021. Um, we're beginning to think, uh, well, of course, land, even in, in Locke's day, like in England, all the land was parceled out um, and enclosed, at least almost all of it. Um, but water is just seen as something that's a product of nature and that nobody would parcel out water and enclose water, that that's not a thing. Uh, but today, there is enclosure of water. People are buying up water rights. I, through my 401k, have some indirect uh, property in water someplace on the other side of the earth. Uh, you know, this is a thing now, but something that Locke conceives of as impossible. Section 34, God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it to them for their benefit and the greatest conveniences of life they were capable to draw from it, it cannot be supposed he meant it should always remain common and uncultivated. He gave it to the use of the industrious and rational, and labor was to be uh, to be his title to it. So that's how you get title to land, right? You put labor into it, not to the fancy or covetousness of the quarrelsome and contentious, right? Not because of legal wranglings, because, but because of the labor you put into it that you get property. He that had as good left for his improvement as was already taken up needed not complain. Uh, ought not to meddle with what was already improved by another man's labor. If he did, it is plain he desired the benefit of another man's pain, of another man's labor, which he had no right to, and not the ground which God had given him in common with others to labor on, and whereof there was as good left, and that already possessed, and more than he knew what to do with, or his industry could reach to. Okay. So he's repeating himself quite a bit here. Let's not go into it. Section 35, it is true in land that is in common in England or any other country where there is plenty of people under government who have money and commerce, no one can enclose or appropriate any part without the consent of all his fellow commoners. Okay, so in the civilization of England, common property cannot be enclosed unless there is consent, because this is left common by compact, by agreement. In other, way, in other words, by the law of the land, which is not to be violated. And though it be common in respect of some men, it is not so to all mankind, but is the joint property of this country or this parish. 
Besides, the remainder after such enclosure would not be as good to the rest of the commoners as the whole was when they could all make use of the whole. Whereas in the beginning and first peopling of the great common of the world, it was quite otherwise. The law man was under was rather uh, for appropriating. God commanded and his wants forced him to labor. That is, man, humans once forced them to labor. That was his property, which could not be taken from him wherever he had fixed it. And hence, subduing or cultivating the earth and having dominion, we see are joining together. The one gave title to the other, so that God, by commanding to subdue, gave authority so far to appropriate, and the condition of human life, which requires labor and materials to work on, raw materials, necessarily introduces private possessions. Okay, very good. And Marx would agree. Let's be clear about that. Marx is not against private property. He's against the appropriation of capitalists of other people's labor, and especially the appropriation of the means of production and the means of industrial production, the factory. That's what Marx wants to be returned to commons. Not your pocket watch, not your iPhone, not your favorite shirt, not your car, not your house. None of that. What is to be common in communism is the factory in this Marx, you know, thinking in Marx's time. Now, how that applies to modern day life when we don't work in a factory, that's another question. But when we talk about communism and Marxism and having property in common, that doesn't mean every personal possession. We're talking about the factory. We're talking about the means of production, whatever that is, which might mean uh, Facebook, for example. If Facebook is part of the means of production, then it should be held in common by those who labor uh, to produce the, the value uh, of Facebook. Like that might be one way of taking this, something to think about. Private possessions, as Locke has described, are no problem within Marxism. Okay, section 36. The measure of property nature has well set by the extent of men's labor and the conveniences of life, no man's labor could subdue or appropriate all, nor could his enjoyment consume more than a small part, so that it was impossible for any man this way to entrench upon the right of another or acquire to himself a property to the prejudice of his neighbor and who would still have room for as good and as large a possession after the other had taken out his as before it was appropriated. This measure did confine every man's possession to a very moderate proportion and such as he might appropriate to himself without injury to anybody in the first ages of the world when men were more in danger to be lost by wandering from their company and the then vast wilderness of the earth than to be straitened for want of room uh, to plant in. And the same measure may be allowed still without prejudice to anybody as full as the world seems for supposing a man or family in the state they were at first peopling of it, the world by children of Adam or Noah. Let him plant in some inland vacant places of America. We shall find that the possessions he could make for himself upon the measures we have given would not be very large, nor even to this day prejudice the rest of mankind or give them reason to complain or think themselves injured by this man's encroachment. Though the race of men have now spread themselves to all the corners of the world and do infinitely exceed the small number uh, was at the beginning. Okay, notice that he mentions America, the places of America, and he's just saying there's so much open land there, you know, appropriate, there's no problem because there's left over. Um, 
And we might say, well, what about the native, like from our modern perspective, our contemporary perspective of 2021, we see how this lays the seeds of problems. But even to the Native Americans, in many instances, they're like, yeah, go and plant your fields over there. That's fine. That doesn't mean you can kick us around all over the countryside and push us to the other side of the continent. We were just saying that you could use an appropriate portion, <laughs> you know? Um, who would ever think that, that you would think that you had right to slaughter our children? Uh, that just is not part of the deal. Section 37, this is certain that in the beginning, before the desire of having more than man needed had, all, had altered the intrinsic value of things, which depends only on their usefulness to the life of man. Uh, okay, and here's another important Marxist concept uh, that we see some, come up. Useful to the life of man, that's use value. Uh, remember that when I did a schematic introduction to Marxism, there's a distinction between use value and exchange value. Use value is what it's actually valuable for to sustain life and provide conveniences. Exchange value is the price, which could be very much disconnected from the use value. Uh, or had agreed that a little piece of yellow metal which would keep without wasting or decay should be worth a great piece of flesh or a whole heap of corn. And so he, Locke here juxtaposes use value versus exchange value. That little lump of gold is, is gold. And, um, and that's the basic concept of money. Uh, in German, which uh, Marx was German and natively spoke German, uh, money is gelt. Money is the word for gold and the word for money are the same. Um, though men had a right to appropriate by their labor, each one of himself as much of the things of nature as he could use, yet this could not be much nor to the prejudice of others where the same plenty was still left to those who would use the same industry. To which let me add that he who appropriates land to himself by his labor does not lessen but increase the common stock of mankind. For the provisions serving to the support of human life produced by one acre of enclosed and cultivated land are to speak much within compass 10 times more than those which are yielded by an acre of land of an equal richness lying waste in common. Lying waste means that it's uncultivated and a cultivated piece of land has added value at least 10 times is what he's saying. And therefore he that encloses land and has a great plenty of the convenience of, the, of life from 10 acres, then he could have from a hundred left to nature may truly be said to give 90 acres to all of mankind, if you do the math. For his labor now supplies him with provisions out of 10 acres, which were but the product of a hundred lying in common. I have here rated the improved land very low in making its product, uh, but as 10 to one, when it is much nearer a hundred to one. For I ask whether in the wild woods and uncultivated waste of America, again America, left to nature without any improvement, tillage or husbandry, a thousand acres yield the needy and wretched inhabitants of any of many conveniences of, of life as 10 acres of equally fertile land in Devonshire where they are well cultivated. Okay, so now we begin to see his, um, his British Eurocentric uh, justification for colonialism, thinking that indigenous people do not labor on the land and do not cultivate, which is false. But he has a prejudicial view of indigenous Americans and has a nationalistic prejudice in favor of his own people. 
Before the appropriation of land, he who gathered as much of the wild fruit, killed, caught, or tamed as many of the beasts as he could, he that so employed his pains about any of the spontaneous products of nature as any way to alter them from the state which nature put them in by placing any of his labor on them, did thereby acquire a priority in a, a propriety in them. But if they perished in his possession without their due use, if the fruits rotted or the venison putrefied before he could spend it, he offended against the common law of nature and was liable to be punished. He invaded his neighbor's share, for he had no right farther than his use called for any of them, and they might serve to afford him conveniences of life. So use value puts a limit on the quantity and quality, or the quantity, I guess, primarily of land and other than property that you can accumulate. So the accumulation of property wealth is limited by what you can actually use. No such limitation was observed in feudalism or in Locke's day in England. So he is uh, raising a serious problem with property rights as they existed in, in England in his day. <clears throat> Section 38, the same measures governed the possession of land too, not just fruit and uh, meat uh, acquired off the land, but the land in and of itself too. Whatsoever he tilled and reaped, laid up and made use of before it spoiled, that was his peculiar right. Whatsoever he enclosed and could feed and make use of, the cattle and product was also his. But if either the grass of his enclosure rotted on the ground or the fruit of his planting perished without gathering and laying up, this part of the earth, what notwithstanding his enclosure, just because he put a fence around it, was still to be looked on as waste and might be the possession of any other. Uh, let's think about this. Does Jeff Bezos, you know, on some accounts, the richest man in the world, but probably actually not, but he's up there. If he has a, an apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan that he visits once a year or maybe every other year and the rest of the time it just sits there empty does he have right to that apartment if he uh, uh, has a private lake where it's stocked with fish and it can be fished at any time at, at his discretion and he visits there every three years and goes fishing for a weekend. Does he have right to those fish while other people are starving? While there are children going to sleep hungry tonight? Is that legitimate property? Locke would say no. Thus, at the beginning, Cain might be might take as much ground as he could till and make it his own, and yet leave enough to able sheep to feed on. A few acres would serve for both their possessions. After Adam and Eve, the first children are Cain and Abel. And so there's only four people in the world. So Cain can have can till as much land as he wants. Abel can it still has plenty of leftover for his sheep. Um, they have the whole world. But as families increased and industry enlarged their stocks, their possessions enlarged with the need of them. But yet it was commonly without any fixed property in the ground they made use of till they incorporated, settled themselves together and built cities. And then by consent, they came in time to set out the bounds of their distinct territories and agree on limits between them and their neighbors. And by laws within themselves, settled the property of those 
of the same society. For we see that in that part of the world which was first inhabited and therefore like to be, uh, like to be best peopled, even as low down as Abraham's time, they wandered with their flocks and their herds, which was their substance. They fre uh, freely up and down. And this Abraham did in a country where he was a stranger. Whence it is plain that at least a great part of the land lay in common, that the inhabitants valued it not nor claimed property in any more than they made use of. But when there was not room enough in the same place for their herds to feed together, they by consent, as Abraham and Lot actually do, do in the Bible, separated and enlarged their pa pasture where it best liked them. And for the same reason, Esau went from his father and his brother and planted in Mount Seir. Also a, a story from the Bible. Section 39, and thus without supposing any private dominion and property in Adam over all the world, exclusive of all other men, which can no way be proved, nor anyone's property be made out of it, but supposing the world given as it was to the children of men in common, we see how labor could make men distinct titles to several parcels of it for their private uses, wherein there could be no doubt of right no room for quarrel. Okay, again, he's arguing against this idea that the monarch has title to the entire land of England or anyone has that, right? Because even Adam himself didn't have right to just everything. Okay, so section 40. Nor is it so strange as perhaps before consideration it may appear that the property of labor should be able to overbalance the community of land, for it is labor indeed that puts the difference of value on everything. Okay, so here, here we clearly have the, the lingo of labor value. It is labor indeed that puts the difference of value on everything. So anything that a person works upon through their labor, that adds value to it. That's what makes it more valuable than the way it just started out coming out of nature. And let anyone consider what the difference is between an acre of land planted with tobacco or sugar sown with wheat or barley and an acre of the same land lying in common without any husbandry upon it. And he will find that the improvement of labor makes the, the far greater part of the value. I think it will be but a very modest computation to say that of the products of the earth useful to the life of man, nine tenths are the effects of labor. Nay, if we will rightly estimate things as they come to our use and cast up the several expenses about them, what in them is purely owing to nature and what to labor? Think of the part added by labor. It's typically a lot more than what nature provided. We shall find that in most of them, 99 hundreds are wholly to put on the account of labor. Um, and, you know, you think of, of wheat, okay, you could think of wheat growing naturally, but you have to collect it and you have to grind it and you have to bake it into bread. You don't just get bread from wheat. Uh, wheat is not bread. And of course, uh, if you plant wheat and put that upfront labor into the process, then it's a lot easier to cultivate you know, so there's labor at every stage of the game. Okay, section 41. There cannot be a clearer demonstration of anything than several nations of the Americans are of this, who are rich in land and poor in all the comforts of life, whom nature have furnished as liberally as any other people with the materials of plenty. In other words, a fruitful soil apt to produce in, a, pr produce in abundance and uh, what might serve for food, raiment and delight, yet for want of improving it by labor have not one hundredth part of the conveniences we enjoy. And a king of a large and fruitful territory there feeds, lodges and is clad worse than a day laborer in England. Okay, 
here we see his prejudice to think that indigenous Americans didn't have a nice, nice lifestyle because they dressed differently. They had a different conception of leisure, uh, but he just can't, he can't get out of his cultural uh, confines to see that. Section 42, to make this a little clearer, let us but trace some of the ordinary provisions of life through their several progresses before they come to our use and see how much they receive of their value from human industry. Bread, wine, and cloth are things of daily use and great plenty, yet notwithstanding acorns, water, and leaves, or skins must be our bread, drink, and clothing. Uh, did not labor finish us with these more useful commodities? For whatever bread is more worth than acorns, wine, more than water, and cloth or silk, than leaves, skins, or moss, that is wholly owing to the labor and industry. The one of these being the food and raiment which unassisted nature furnishes us with, the other provisions which our industry and pains prepare for us, which how much they exceed the other in value when any one hath computed, he will then see how much labor makes the far greatest part of the value of things we enjoy in this world. And the ground which produces the materials is scarce to be reckoned in as any or at most, but a very small part of it. So little that even amongst us land that is left wholly to nature that hath no improving, improvement of pasturage, tillage, or planting is called, as indeed it is, waste. And we shall find the benefit of it amount to little more than nothing. This shows how much numbers of men are to be prepared, uh, preferred to, uh, to large, this shows how much numbers of men are to be preferred to largeness of dominions, and that the increase of lands and the right employing of them is the great art of governments, and that prince who shall be so wise and godlike as to establish laws of liberty to secure protection and, and encouragement to the honest industry of mankind against the oppression of power and narrowness of party will quickly be too hard for his neighbors, but this by the by. Okay. So he says that government really at essence is, is established to manage property rights, especially land property rights. And he says, okay, but more about that later, by the by. Okay, section 43, an acre of land that bears here 20 bushels of wheat, another in America, which with the same husbandry would do the like, are without doubt of the same natural intrinsic value, but yet the benefit mankind receives from the one in a year is worth 51 and from the other possibly not worth a penny. If all the profit an Indian received from it were to be valued and sold here. Okay, so he's saying that an indigenous American who doesn't till the soil is letting that soil go to waste because if they were to till it and, and sell the goods over in England, they would get this, this exchange value. Now he's, he's confusing use value with exchange value. So he, he set up that distinction earlier on, but then proceeds to convolute them because of his cultural prejudice. So, um, so we, hear, we see here the big sort of problem. This is the problematic of, of, of what he's saying, what's, what's very problematic. But he's laying out some, uh, some basic concepts that then are gonna be very valuable. <laughs> At least I may truly say not 1,000 you know, the value that an indigenous American gets out of the land. It is labor then which puts the greatest part of value upon land without which it would scarcely be worth anything. 
It is to that we owe the greatest part of all its useful products for all that we, the straw bran bread of the acre of wheat is more worth than the product of an acre as good land, which lies waste is all the labor, not barley, the plowman's pains, the reapers and threshers toil and the baker's sweat is to be counted into the bread we eat. The labor of those who broke the oxen, who dig the rot, uh, digged and wrought the iron and stones who felled and framed the timber employed about the plow, mill, oven, or any other utensil, which are a vast number requisite to this corn, this, this uh, grain, from its uh, being feed to be sown uh, to its being made bread, must all be charged on the account of labor and receive as an effect of that nature and the earth furnished only the almost worthless materials as in themselves. It would be a strange catalog of things that industry provided and made use of about every loaf of bread before it came to our use if we could trace them. Iron, wood, leather, bark, timber, stone, bricks, coals, lime, cloth, dyeing dr drugs, pitch, uh, tar, mass, ropes, and all the materials made use of in the ship that brought any of the commodities made use of by any of the workmen to any part of the work, all which it would be almost impossible at least too long to reckon up. So again, there's just all this value because of all the complexities of market exchange that is built into even a piece of bread. Okay. Um, but notice that he does say here that he speaks of almost worthless, worthless materials as in themselves. Not only is there a prejudice against the labor of indigenous Americans that they don't labor, like he just has this idea that indigenous Americans are not laboring, which is false at his time. He also thinks of the natural products of nature as being utterly worthless. And this is problematic from the perspective of our ecological cataclysm. This is some of the roots of the ecological cataclysm that Europeans um, are prejudiced into thinking that nature in its natural state is worthless. Uh, but this is a very short-sighted ethnocentric uh, wrong-headed, uh, false view. And we're seeing the consequences of that now in our own lives. Section 44, from all which it is evident that though the, time, the things of nature are given in common, yet man by being master of himself and proprietor of his own person and the actions of labor of it, had still in himself the greatest foundation of property and that which made up the great part of what he applied to the support or comfort of his being when invention and arts had improved the convenience of life was perfectly his own and did not belong in common to others. Section 45, thus labor in the beginning gave a right to property wherever anyone was pleased to employ it upon what was common, which remained a long while the far greater part and is yet more than mankind makes use of. Men at first, for the most part, contented themselves with what unassisted nature offered to their necessities. And though afterwards in some parts of the world where the increase of people and stock with the use of money had made land scarce and so of some value, the several commodities settled the bounds of their distinct territories uh, the several communities settled the bounds of their distinct territories and by laws within themselves regulated the properties of the private men of their society. And so by compact and agreement settled the property which labor and industry began. And the leagues that ha have been made between several states and kingdoms, either expressly or tacitly, disowning all claim and right to the land in the other's possession, have by common consent given up their pretenses to their natural common right, which originally they had to those countries and so have by positive agreement settled the property amongst themselves in distinct parts and parcels of the earth. 
yet there are still great tracts of ground to be found, which the inhabitants thereof, not having joined with the rest of mankind in the consent of the use of their common money, lie waste and are more than the people who dwell on it to do or can make use of. And so still lie in common, though this can scarce happen amongst that part of mankind that have consented to the use of money. So now he's giving an argument. Here we see it's, he's kind of been laying it in little by little, but here we see his argument for settler colonialism and the appropriation of the land of indigenous Americans, that they're just letting it go to waste. And so we can take it by right. He has, again, convoluted use value with exchange value. Notice the, the talk of money. And he also has contradicted himself because what was what previously uh, well i guess he he has not entirely contradicted himself because he's saying that if somebody encloses a very large tract of land if they're not really making use of it for their personal use then others can take of it okay and he's comparing the indigenous americans to that uh, but for example, he's not thinking of, uh, of like the tribes of the Great Plains who use large tracts of land at this time to hunt buffalo. Just because you don't see the value in it doesn't mean that there's not value in it. Just because there's not English money value in it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a uh, use value and use value is fundamental even on Locke's argument. Uh, so there would be a lot of arguments to make against this, but he is justifying settler colonialism by saying that indigenous Mer Americans are, are laying claim to land that is going to waste. Section 46, the greatest part of things really useful to life to the life of man and such as the necessity of subsisting made the first commoners of the word, world look after as it doth the Americans now are generally things of short duration, such as if they are not consumed by use will decay and perish of themselves. Gold, silver, and diamonds are things that fancy or agreement have put the value on more than real use and the necessary support of life. Now of those good things which nature hath provided in common, every one had a right as hath been said to as much as he could use and property in all that he could effect with his labor, all that his industry could extend to, to alter from the state of nature had put in it was his. He hath gathered a hundred bushels of acorns or apples, had thereby a property in them. They were his goods as soon as gathered. He was only to look that he used them before they spoiled, else he took more than his share and robbed others. And indeed, it was a foolish thing as well as dishonest to hoard up more than he could make use of. If he gave away a part to anybody else so that it perished not uselessly in his possession, these he also made use of. And if he also bartered away plums that would have rotted in a week for nuts that would last good for his eating a whole year, he did no injury. He wasted not the common stock, destroyed no part of the portion of goods that belonged to others. So long as nothing perished uselessly, uselessly in his hands, again, if he would give his nuts for a piece of meat, pleased with its color, or exchange his sheep for shells or wool or a sparkling pebble or a diamond and keep those by him all his life, he invaded not the right of others. He might heap up as much of those durable things as he pleased. The exceeding of the bounds of his just property, not lying in the largeness of his possession, but the perishing of anything uselessly in it. Okay. So I think this, I, I think now after reading this paragraph, I can make a little bit of better argument against what he's saying about settler colonialism and thinking of the Native Americans of the Great Plains. Uh, 
what the settler colonialists did is came in and destroyed all the buffalo and just wasted it. And so he's justifying a genocide and wasting not only buffalo, but just committing a genocide against people. There can be no justification for that on the basis of his property arguments. Um, he just, because of his cultural prejudice, just could not foresee the ruthlessness with which settler colonialism was actually already taking place. If he, if he cared, he could have looked it up. He could have read uh, Bartolome de las Casas, for example. Plain and simple. He could look in the English newspapers to find out about the slave trade happening in Jamestown, where obviously the tilling of tobacco, which he mentions, is being conducted by the appropriation directly of other people's labor. Uh, but he just carefully avoids details that are inconvenient. Okay, so section 47, and thus came in the use of money, some lasting thing that men might keep without spoiling. Okay, and here we see money as the universal commodity, as Marx talks about, and being in the form of gold that does not uh, rust and, and you can store it over long periods of time. And that by mutual consent of men would take an exchange for the truly useful. So we have exchange value versus use value, um, but perishable supports life. Okay, so useful things are perishable, Gold is not perishable, but not useful, but it has exchange value. It's very interesting to see all these concepts built into Locke, uh, you know, hundreds of years before Marx writes uh, Capital. And somehow though, uh, when Marxists talk about exchange value versus use value, those who would purport to be part of the tradition of Locke have a big problem with this. Um, again, Marx is not inventing the basic concepts. He's just drawing out their logical conclusions. Okay, so section 48. And as different degrees of industry were apt to give men possessions in different proportions, so this invention of money gave them the opportunity to continue and enlarge them for supposing an island separate from all possible commerce with the rest of the world, wherein there were but an hundred families, but there were sheep, horses, and cows with other useful animals, wholesome fruits, and land enough for corn for a hundred thousand times as many, but nothing in the island, either because of its commonness or perishableness, fit to supply the place of money, what reason could anyone have there to enlarge his possessions beyond the use of his family and plentiful supply to his consumption, either in what their own industry produced or they could barter for like perishable useful commodities with others. Where there is nothing, not some thing both lasting and scarce like gold and so valuable to be hoarded up, their men will not be apt to enlarge their possessions of land were it never so rich, never so free for them to take. For I ask, what would a man value 10,000 or 100,000 acres of excellent land ready cultivated and well stocked, in, stocked too with cattle in the middle of the inland parts of America where he had no hopes of commerce with other parts of the world to draw money to him by the sale of the product. It would not be worth the enclosing and we should see him give up again to the wild common of nature, whatever was more than would supply the conveniences of life to be had there for him and his family. Okay, so this is part of his larger argument about money and commerce and that uh, if the Native Americans would just get integrated with uh, the commerce, then they could sell their goods. Now this overlooks the fact that if Native Americans were to do this, like for example, the uh, Cherokee nation who was pushed around the East Coast and but desperately tried to integrate, desperately tried to become a part of the commercial infrastructure uh, 
uh, of the American colonies and, and ultimately after the United States was formed was pushed out to Oklahoma on a death march because they supposed that they were humans just like everybody else and could be integrated into American society, but were driven on a death march uh, thousands and thousands of miles uh, for purely racial reasons. Uh, you know, all of this Locke is overlooking. He has an idealistic, ideological, uh, culturally conditioned way of looking at the world that just overlooks the basic facts, um, which we are, you know, in general, Americans are becoming a little more aware of than they were when I was a kid. Okay. <clears throat> Section 49, thus in the beginning, all the world was America and more so than it is now for no such thing as money was anywhere known. Find out something that has the use and value of money amongst his neighbors, you shall see the same man will begin presently to enlarge his possessions. Okay, but since gold and silver being little useful to the life of man in proportion of food, raiment, and carriage has its value only from the consent of men, whereof labor yet makes in great part the measure, it is plain that men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. Uh, he says that men have agreed to the disproportionate, disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. They have, by a tacit and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land than he himself can use the product of. By receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up without injury to any one. These metals not spoiling or decaying in the hands of the possessor, this partage of things and an inequality of private possessions men have made practicable out of the bounds of society and without compact only by putting a value on gold and silver and tacitly agreeing to the use of money. For in governments the laws regulate the right of property and the possession of land is determined by positive constitutions. Uh, I want to make comment about this, but let me read the last section. Section 51, and thus, I think it is very easy to conceive without any difficulty how labor could at first begin a title of property in, common, in the common things of nature and how the spending it upon our uses bounded it so that there could then be no reason for quarreling about title nor any doubt about the largeness of possession it gave, right and convincingly went together for as a man had a right to all he could employ his labor upon, so he had no temptation to labor, labor far more than he could make use of. This left no room for controversy about title, nor for encroachment on the right of others. What portion a man carved to himself was easily seen, and it was useless as well as dishonest to carve himself too much or to take more than he needed. Okay, so we have this natural state in which there are bounds set upon the quantity of possession, but Locke sees that through the device of money, somehow people are able to hoard up money, which doesn't seem a problem on his view, but somehow he subtly transfers that to hoarding up land. and says that by the device of money, people have agreed to allow people to hoard up and spoil and waste lands in England because of the device of money, but because the Native Americans don't have money, they can't enclose large tracts of land and let them go waste. There, there's a disconnect here. And to unpack that, uh, Maybe uh, I haven't quite successfully done that, but hopefully you can see that there is a disconnect. And I'll have to think about saying that, that more succinctly and giving a better analysis. But 
there's certainly a problem here because he's not merely talking about stacking up gold, which on his argument, he, he does make an argument saying gold you can stack up because nobody can eat gold. But what he's somehow subtly overlooking and, and maybe just uh, begging the question, I think is what he's doing, is that is that it's somehow through the device of money it's okay to to hoard land and produce so that some have too much to eat and others have too little and that everybody's agreed to that that the poor have agreed to starve because of the money and that, that's a very strange argument because the poor don't have the money if those who want to have too much to eat, you know, the rich and fancy who throw away pounds and pounds of food while others go hungry, or who elaborate all these cooking methodologies and have their personal chef and, and, and spend all this to uh, make themselves, uh, you know, have more food than they can eat and then go in the bathroom and throw it up, you know, as, as many wealthy people do. Um, that somehow they have the right to waste things in that way because of money, but then we would think that the money would have to be in the hands of the people who don't have the food. But it just so happens that the people who have all the food and are wasting the food are the people that have all the money. So there was no exchange. So there's a problem here. Um, <clears throat> again, the, the prejudice of Locke is, is unbearable. All right, I'll leave it at that. But, well, one more thing, but these concepts of labor value, use value, exchange value, you know, we can, we can get on board with that. But the idea that magically somehow people hoarding up money allows them to waste food while others are starving, that doesn't fly. That doesn't fit with his argument. He hasn't made that argument. He just throws it in. 